Hey. Um, so first of all, the type of this lecture said it's going to be a workshop. Just to make the expectations clear, I have a few slides prepared that should give you a general introduction, and they will take probably about half of the time we have allocated for the slot. And afterwards, we can answer your questions or have some hands down hacking on actual packages. Um, my name is Michael Stapelberg. Just a quick show of hands so that I know my audience. Who of you maintains a Debian package in Debian or derivatives? OK, that's almost everybody. Perfect. How many have actually added systemd support to their packages already? OK, a couple. Who of you are looking into doing that? OK, perfect. You're exactly the right audience. Great. So the topics I want to cover with my slides are, first of all, how systemd works for package maintainers. That means I'm not going to cover all of it, um, and also it's not so much of a user standpoint, but just what you need to know to get you started on testing your stuff in systemd. We will then have a look at an example service file where we'll make clear what all the different directives are supposed to mean. We will look at the temp files mechanism and at DH systemd, a dep helper plugin. We will consider a few more advanced examples, and then finally we will answer your questions, hopefully. So non-topics for this presentation are systemd sucks, let's just use something else instead, when will Debian finally switch to default, and essentially anything that ever came up on Debian Devil. I'm not going to talk about that, right? This is just about how to make it work if you already accepted that that's something you want to do. So how does systemd work? Um, essentially, where we previously had init scripts, we now have service files. Service files are just a special kind of unit files, so the more generic term is unit files, and that what corresponds to an init script is a service file, right? So previously you would have uh, slash etc init.d slash apache2 as an init script, and the corresponding file would be slash lib slash systemd slash system slash apache2.service. Now, what's important here to notice is that the base name, so to say, apart from the dot .service suffix, needs to be the same, because what will happen is that systemd, when booting on a, on, a, on a machine, will look at all the services in slash etc slash init.d and use them if they're available. But if there is also a service file, that will take precedence. So in order to make sure that systemd uses your service file and not your service file plus the old init script, make sure that the name is correct. Um, before you ask, yes, there's also mechanisms to make sure that when you have a name transition, because you've adopted the upstream name for a service file or something like that, then you can have a compatibility symlink. We can cover that later. And essentially, systemctl does what service did. Um, so if you had service apache2 start, then you would use systemctl start apache2.service. In recent versions, you can even skip the .service prefix, so it would just be systemctl start apache2. Um, the systemctl tool is mostly for the actual users or for you when testing. Um, and just like you would usually use etc in the Apache 2 start as an actual user, but service inside your maintenance scripts, we have something for that. Now, what we had in system 5 in it were run levels, and they were poorly defined and different from distribution to distribution. And what systemd does to replace them is it has something called a target. Now, a target is precisely the same as a run level. It ha just has a much nicer name, and the names are standardized um, between all the different distributions. The most important targets for you are basic.target, multi-user.target, and graphical.target. Um, each of them is you know, more specific than the other in that it starts more services for a particular use case. So basic.target is what everybody of you will run. And then multi-user.target extends basic.target with more stuff. And graphical.target brings in all the graphical components like a display manager and stuff that you would normally not use on servers, where multi-user.target is what you would want to use. You can look that up if you care later on in the man page systemd.special. Now, just as previously with system5 in it, we had symlinks to enable a service, and these symlinks were created by update-rc.d. We still have symlinks to enable a service. Now they're just created by systemctl enable. Um, again, systemctl is what you would use as a user or while testing, etc., and we have a maintainer script equivalent of that. All right, are there any questions so far? This is really the basic stuff. Okay, question. Uh, 
Uh, what's the reason that there are different commands for the user and the maintenance scripts? Um, the, the reason, um, I think I will go into this later, but I can just briefly explain it. Um, the maintenance scripts also need to work on machines where systemd is not actually installed. Okay. So that's why we can't use systemct. All right, now let's look an at an example service file. Uh, I just picked vnstat.service, which is a, a tiny daemon that will just um, store and plot later on your uh, network traffic. Um, what you can see here is a very clear um, human-readable configuration file, and this is the service file. It's called vnstat.service. It starts with um, a unit section, and you can see just like uh, any files, which probably everybody of you is uh, comfortable with, or .desktop files, which have the same format. So this is actually a .desktop file. Um, there are sections which are enclosed in square brackets, and then there's key value pairs uh, separated by an equal sign. So that's really simple. Um, the first section is entirely just for humans. So the description will tell me what kind of service this is if I'm looking at my system and wondering what is this that's starting up here. Um, the second section is the service section, and this is actually where you know all the relevant stuff is. Um, what we specify here in the second line is xx start, which is the command that systemd will run when trying to start that service, right? Um, so in this case, it's really simple. You just start the vnstatd binary. Um, what you need to notice here, though, is that systemd does not invoke a shell to start that up. Um, so you need to specify the full path, and you don't have your usual shell stuff in your command line, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, we also have the exec reload line, and there could also be an exec stop line. In the absence of an exec stop line, systemd will just kill the service, right? And it will do what many, many people implemented in init scripts um, by hand. It will just gently try to kill it, and if that doesn't work within a certain time span, then it will try to kill it harder until it finally succeeds. Now, the exec reload line is pretty standard. Um, the thing is that not all of the services provide a way of reloading in the first place. So we need to have such a line to tell systemd what to do on a reload command. Some other uh, services, you could probably think of the bind name server, have a different way of reloading. So you could call rndc reload in that case. Um, but this one is just really simple. It just sends a sick up to the service, and then it will reload. Right? Um, the dollar main PID is not actually a shell variable or anything. It's just a special thing that you can use in unit files and service files in, in particular. And then we also have the user line, which will uh, specify um, under which user this program will be started. That's pretty straightforward. Now, the last section is also interesting. Uh, it's called the install section, and it has a line called wanted by equals multi-user.target. And that essentially says that when this service file is enabled on the machine, um, it will be pulled in by multi-user.target. So this specifies which run level it, run it runs in, so to say. Okay, um, are there any questions so far? Yes, ah, microphone. Can there be a more than one uh, wanted by line? Yes, there can be multiple wanted by lines. More questions over there? Yes. So just to make sure that I understand correctly, yes. if systemd tries to we start a reload a service. It first executes this reload phrase and then the exec start phrase again. Uh, or no. Th okay. um, so there's two different cases here. One is the reload case and the other one is the restart case. Right. Okay. Um, in the reload case, it just executes what's specified here. Mm. If the service file supports reloading, if it doesn't, then you can't reload it. If you do a restart, it will first execute stop if present or kill it if not present and then start it again. Right. Okay. Thank okay. you. One more question here. Okay. Uh, is there a um, equivalent to Debian's fourth reload where you care so much about wanting to reload that you're okay with it falling back to stop and start if necessary, which Debian sysvian its system does support in the usual skeleton file? Um, I think there is a try reload action, but I would have to confirm that. We can do that later. Yes. Is there also something to stop a service? Well, yeah, I already mentioned that you can specify okay. exec stop, and if you don't, it will just kill it, right? Is, does right, that sorry, answer your I question? Didn't, yeah, okay. sure, I Perfect. didn't hear that. One more question here. Oh, yeah, re there's... Revise the reload if possible, yeah, and then the falls back to restart. Yes, he just said there's a, a reload or restart command in systemctl that does precisely what you asked for. Are there other things than start, reload, stop, and... Can you define other things? 
Uh, could you clarify what you mean by that? Um, status. Um, yes, um, I will actually show you some of the actions uh, later on. This is but just I was to, thinking to make more about something specific to a certain daemon that, for instance, fetch mail can have an awaken option. It has a sleep of five minutes or something, and then you say, trigger it now. And what exactly is the question? I still don't quite So get. can you have some exact line there to Oh, define? so can you have a custom action like an init script? Is that what you mean? No, you can't. Um, <laughs> there is uh, different ways of coping with that. So you could, there's most often there's an alternative to what you want to do. Um, but I think it's really clean and nice that they standardized on a few verbs. And all of these work with all of the services, except for the reload one, obviously. Um, but you can't have really custom weird stuff. Uh, you could ship that in an additional shell script. That's what I would usually uh, use as the first suggestion if there's no specific, no, no better way of solving the problem. But we can discuss that later on for specific services that you might have in mind. OK, any more general questions up until here? Yes. I d uh, maybe you answered and, you, and I, I missed it. But uh, about the status, the um, possibility to query the status of the, of the service? Yes. There is. Uh, yes, obviously. I, as I said, I will show that all okay, in, yeah, sorry. In, in the second part. All right. Now, temp files. Um, the temp files mechanism is really useful, not only within systemd, but um, also oftentimes when people read about it, they think, hey, this could be useful standalone. What it does is it creates, it, it provides a mechanism to configure creating temporary directories, like runtime directories. So um, as a really simple example, I have here the Lighty um, configuration file uh, where it will essentially say create a directory called slash run slash lighty um, with this mode, this user, uh, this group, and no more arguments. Um, there are some arguments you could specify there for cleaning it up um, every, say, 10 days or some delay like that. That's all supported. Um, this mechanism is much more powerful than this very simple example. Um, it can also support you know, not only file, not only directories, but also files, pipes, symlinks, etc. Um, I don't want to go into all of the details, but this is the preferred mechanism to create a slash run slash something, um, and it's much much cleaner than having you know all these varying mkdir commands that sometimes specify a user and a group, and sometimes they don't, and then they don't have a mode, etc., etc., etc. So this is what we want to use. Question. But uh, there's no implicit conflict resolving, so I have to take care that I do a proper namespace organization. And for example, call my temporary uh, directory like my service and let not choose an arbitrary name which would perhaps clash with another service. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, you need to watch out for file system clashes in them in packages. That's just so as it always has been. Yes. So it's the mechanism you have to provide the policy. Yeah. Yes, obviously. All right. Um, service file location. Oftentimes, um, the upstream provider ships a service file, and that's the way it's meant to be, because the upstream should know best uh, how to install the service on a particular machine, right? Um, now, that doesn't always happen. Um, but if it happens, please use the upstream service file. And if the upstream service file is really broken, please work with upstream to fix it. If it's broken in some minor detail, you might ask upstream if it's acceptable you know, to change it in the way that it would be better. Um, I don't have any specific details. Um, one example that would come to mind is that some upstream service files are actually pretty old. Like they were written in 2009 or something. Um, and by now, they're, for example, referring to syslog.target as a dependency, whereas syslog is auto-started nowadays via socket activation. So that could be removed, and then the service file would be simpler and more idiomatic, and that would be a typical change that you could push upstream. Now, I don't say that I expect anybody of you to know what the idiomatic service files are um, and contribute that upstream. I'm just saying it would be the right thing to do. Question. Yes, um, you know, just right there, Debian slash package name dot service and dot temp files. Yes. But uh, most the dep helpers also accept just service yes. and or uh, well just the type of the file without the package prefix if there's only one binary package build. Does yes. is that supported? Um, to be honest I didn't test it, but I'm using the exact same dep helper plugin code that all the others are using, so I would expect it to be supported. What we also support, even though I didn't actually program it, is package dot and then some actual package name if it's only for a specific package in a set of all packages, which is a typical DevHelper feature in that sense. Thanks. Sure. Um, 
So now to actually cover that point, if upstream doesn't ship a, a service file um, and or a temp file, then you can just place them in Debian slash your packages name.service and .temp file, and it will be installed. Um, it will be installed by dh install init, which might confuse you, because dh install init is for init scripts and not for service files. And in fact, we by now have dh systemd, so that's weird. And the only reason why that is is because of historic reasons. We first started implementing it in dh install init, but then it turned out that it would make the helper very complex and weird and handle upstart and sysv and systemd all at the same time is really not a good idea. So we decided to you know, leave it there for the time being, but eventually migrate it. Um, if you use just the dh command, it will all just work. You don't have to care. Um, in all the other cases, currently policy dictates that you still need to ship an init uh, script. So that's all fine. Um, and as soon as the policy gets changed, I promise that we will be in the state where you don't have to care about this either. Um, OK, I already mentioned that. Please send service files upstream. I will just stress it again. Not only if you have an upstream service file and modify it and fix it, please send it upstream. But also, if you create a service file, please send it upstream so that upstream can distribute it. Some upstream software might not agree. Um, some are actually very thankful. Question over there. Um, assuming upstream ships a valid service file, what's the best practice? Is it to call it's installing it, specifying the path in the upstream directory, or copy it in the Debian directory before DH installing it is invoked? Uh, in case upstream installs it, just let upstream install it. I don't, I'm not sure I get the question. Um, I suppose the question is, in case upstream does not install it, oh they yeah, ship okay. it, but they don't install it. OK, in case they don't install it, and then what was the second part of your question? Just put it in Debian slash, as I explained. So you can put it manually in Debian slash before the h install init is invoked. Oh, right, Or yes. you can invoke the h install init with the path in the upstream directory. OK. Ah, so if upstream doesn't install it but ship it. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you could either manually Wait. copy it before or just use what you suggested. Yes. OK, any more questions? Great, let's move on. Now, um, getting your service enabled, I already mentioned that just as with update RCD, you need to enable services. And um, the easiest way, if you already have a service file shipped by upstream, or if you put your own service file into Debian slash package.service, is you add a build dependency on DH systemd, and then you use the DH command, which you hopefully already use, um, and add the dash dash with equals systemd flag. And then all automatically happens, and it will just work. Now, um, the maintainer scripts uh, that are generated as part of that package build will contain the appropriate code. Um, they will call a binary called depsystemd helper instead of systemctl, as I mentioned earlier, um, which avoids having a dependency on systemd on all the packages, which is probably politically not a good move. Um, now, if you are not using DH, you can also add the DH systemd enable and DH systemd start calls directly. Um, in the wiki, we have instructions, and the link is provided on these slides. To test your package, oh, there's a question here. So you mentioned the deb uh, systemd helper yes. maintainer scripts. The, so I know the scope of systemd is broader than sysv init, but in the sysv init world, policy recommends whether or not you are using sysv init, including other things like sysv rc or open rc or a few of the other minor ones, and I think also upstart. Um, they recommend using invoke rc.d and update rc.d in Debian maintainer scripts yes. as a way of both abstracting from the specific system and for handling the case where you're bootstrapping and the demons are not running be because of policy rc.d. So the question is, why this instead of those? And if policy rc.d is configured to not start or stop, we'll disrespect that. Yes, so um, we have another of these helpers called dev system the invoke, which is for the invoke rc.d part, and it will try to respect policy. Unfortunately, policy is really hard. It's a really horrible standard. It's underdocumented, and I had a really hard time figuring out how it works. So it will support the use cases I could identify. And if you have a use case that is broken, please talk to me, and we can try to fix it. Um, also, to answer the second part of your, the first part of your question, actually, um, update rc.d. It's really hard to um, have a good 
uh, solution in there. We tried implementing it in there, but it turned out to not work that well, and upstream is not that responsive to our concerns. Um, so we tr um, actually chose to implement a separate helper that we had in tight control and can release independently of this VRC, which turned out to be a much, much better solution because already we refactored it once and iterated on it uh, quite a few times. And by now, it's actually in a pretty good state. Um, so yeah, that's why. All right. Um, to test your package, which is actually the most interesting part, you will just install systemd, and then you can boot with the init equals slash bin slash systemd kernel parameter. Now, install systemd does not involve breaking sysv in it or anything. There's no conflicts in that package. You can still have both of them. If you just install systemd, nothing will happen. If you boot with init equals bin systemd, you will actually use systemd, right? So that distinction is important. You can always switch back and forth. So testing it is really simple. You just reboot. You could reboot in a VM if you don't like to reboot your main machine. Um, then what you would typically do is you check your service starts properly on boot. Um, you would probably check the reload action, check stop, start, restart, and that's about it, I would say. Um, because there's really not that much more to it, except if your service makes use of really advanced features and all that stuff. Um, in general, um, I would say that your users will report bug reports if your service does not work with systemd right now. Um, so there's plenty of users of systemd in Debian that care enough to submit bug reports. So it's not expected of you to test it you know, all the time and convert all your systems and run it all the time and all that stuff. A brief test will be enough. OK, um, so now to an advanced example. Um, there's actually a few more features that were maybe already mentioned if you um, listened to the previous talk by Leonard. Um, we have a nice service called Debian Code Search, which I happen to maintain. And uh, the service file is actually much more complicated. It uh, not only specifies a user and a group, um, it also has some arguments in here. And you can see that the service file format supports line wrapping. So if your command line is pretty long, then it might make sense to wrap it and have it really nice. Um, also, we have standard output redirected to devnull because it's really noisy and mostly used for debugging. So whenever I feel like debugging it, I can just change that to get standard output. But in the default case, I just want standard error. Now, also, my service does not actually care to log to syslog. So I say that standard error should go to the journal, which will then end up in the syslog. Um, also, I cannot obviously exclude that there are bugs. But I also cannot sit in front of a computer 24-7 and restart my server if it crashes. So uh, what I want is that whenever it fails, that is, it exits with an exit code um, that is not zero, I want it to just wait a second and then restart it. Um, so far, I think in production, I al only restarted my service once um, and then promptly fixed the bug. So most of the time, it's bug-free. But you know, better safe than sorry. Um, so the, the other parts of the unit file are probably clear by now. And um, what you will see in practice is that most of the service files really look kind of the same. Right. It's pretty simple. They're pretty short. They all use these same features. Um, one more interesting feature that you should be aware of. Uh, who of you, show of hands, ships a, uh, man uh, maintains a package that ships a Dbus service? One, two? OK. Um, so for the others, it's more of an academic interest. But systemd actually can care about uh, Dbus activated services. So whereas uh, Dbus would usually start them on its own in older versions, um, nowadays it's better to use systemd for it because then it all ends up in you know, the same hierarchy and it all gets tracked and you get all the benefits and stuff. So what you do is you add type equals dbus and you specify the bus name and you don't have an install section. It's not missing on the slide. It's just not there. And then a systemd will activate that service whenever that bus name is actually accessed. All right. Um, OK, so this is a more advanced example of the DH system, the Dep helper plugin. Um, what we do here is we install a service that should not actually be installed by default. And um, the way we do this is we override the DH system, the enable target, and specify the dash dash no enable flag. This should not be a surprise to anybody of you who has been using Dep helper in the past. Um, I just wanted to mention it and make sure that you, know, you understand what the options are here. Um, and 
I will answer that in a second. Um, the second example here is for the second part of the DH system D dev pepper plugin. It's DH system D start. And what I specify here is the dash dash restart after upgrade flag, which will make sure that the package does not get stopped, then replaced, then started, but will just get replaced and then restarted afterwards, which is you know kind of cleaner, but the package needs to support it. Question. So why do you call the DH system D enable with a f option of dash dash no enable instead of just leaving the target empty? That's an excellent question, and the comment above tries to somewhat explain it. Um, the thing is that when you purge the package, um, if the user decided to enable it, even though you ship it disabled by default, then you need to clean up these symlinks, right? So that's what DH system the enable also generates main scripts for. So that still needs to run, so we can't just skip it. Uh, in the first version, we tried, but it didn't work out. OK, more questions. In the back. Yes, um, you mentioned services triggered by debus actions. Yes. Is there a way to disable them even if the service is installed? Yes, you can mask any service. I can show you that later. Uh, one more question. So you say restart after upgrade. How does restart, I guess this is more general, but it's prompted mm -hmm. by this. Yes. How does restart work if the service is not running? Um, that's a good question. I would have to really look it up. Um, I think I think there is a try restart action but that would um, you know restart if it if it's running, but not start it if it's not running. But because the for example, in this case, the uh, you set up the service to uh, remain disabled upon install yes. in this example. So if you install the package, it is not enabled, yes. and then you, the user takes no action, and then they upgrade their system. Yes. And a new version of the package is installed, yes. it tries to restart? Uh, yes, so the thing is, um, as I was saying, uh, there is a restart action in systemctl and there's a try restart. The difference is try restart will only restart it if it's running, which probably answers your question. Now, the caveat is that um, currently, if you ship a, if you maintain a package that ships a system5 in a script and a systemd service file, it will still use invoke rcd for the actual you know, starting, restarting, etc. Um, and the invoke rcd actually has code to divert that to systemd, um, but the problem is it's not flexible enough to use try restart and all the fancy stuff, so this might need some actual hand tweaking or just ignoring it for now. All right, um, so before we enter the questions and hands-on part of this workshop, um, I just want to make sure that you're all aware that we will provide help. There is a wiki page which is linked here called systemd slash packaging, which um, contains uh, most of the information, hopefully, or at least pointers. We have an IRC channel on irc.debian.org called uh, hash debian-systemd, where you can just stop by at any time. And there's most of the time somebody around who actually knows how to write service files and stuff. There is a mailing list that we are all active, and we really do mean it. Please ask. Also, during DebConf, if there is at any time any question um, from anybody of you or from your friends, um, please ask. We're here for answering these sorts of questions. Now, just one more quick note, finding documentation. Um, there are MAN pages, a lot of MAN pages. They are roughly categorized by the sections that I previously showed in service files. So there's a systemd.service, there's a systemd.exec, et cetera. Um, there's also an overview on the freedesktop.org website where it um, points to all documentation. The particularly interesting parts of that are the systemd for administrators blog series where Leonard kind of talks about a lot of features that are interesting and how to actually make use of them in your service files. Um, and then there's a link for package repositories of the various distributions where you can just look if there already is a service file for that particular package that you maintain, even though it doesn't ship one upstream. So the best thing uh, in that case would be to adopt the service file and then also make upstream accept that. All right, um, that's the talk part so far, um, now I'm ready to answer any questions or look at any packages. Uh, what is the plan for, the, for backports? I mean, uh, if, you wa if you want to, to ease backports too easy, uh, can we use uh, the DH system helper? Or, uh yes, um, so the DH systemd helper is available in Wheezy backports. Um, be aware that the systemd version in Wheezy is version 44, and we're currently trying to get uh, version 204, which is much more recent. Um, into Debian. 
Um, it had a version of jump because of UDIF. Um, so it's not that much more recent. It's just more recent. <laughs> um, so there might be issues. And it's up to you if you decide to uh, commit to maintaining support for that old systemd version with your service files in Wheezy. So just, you know, just that you know. Um, if there's no immediate questions, I would just go on to show you a little bit of stuff. And then we can answer questions as they go along. Uh, I have to pretend that I act at the moment I'm not maintaining any package who has, um, in general, has to start uh, um, daemons at, at, uh, yes. at, at power on. Uh, and so I know nearly nothing about it. Yes. But uh, I, I'm a bit confused. Uh, uh, since I understand there are a, lo a lot of these kind of systems to system D, sysv init, and, and so on. Yes. Uh, as, as a package maintainer, uh, what uh, have I to do to, uh, I have, uh, if I want to support the, uh, all of them, I have to provide, uh, uh, okay, the, the script or, or, or description file that they need uh, yes. for each, each so of them. To, to answer this, um, the policy uh, mandates. For example, um, just to complete the question. Okay. In, parti if, in, in particular, we consider just CSV in it, that it is one we have uh, by default, and systemd, which we are discussing now. Yes. Uh, I have if uh, if I want to provide systemd uh, information file, do I also have to um, to to provide uh, um, sysv uh, init uh, scripts, or is that some compatibility layer that uh, um, enables me to write one thing uh, and at least in common cases uh, expect uh, uh, yes. some magic to to make it working for other systems? Okay, I would be happy to answer that after the talk because that's not really the focus of this talk. Okay. Okay, so now let me just show you a few handy things that uh, might be useful. So um, I have a terminal here that you hopefully can read in the back. Is that okay? Yeah, great. Um, so let's just have a look at thinkfan.service. Um, and what I was using here is the systemctl command, and you can see multiple interesting things. First of all, it's active and running, um, so that's good. Um, it shows that I started it six days ago when I last rebooted my laptop also shows the main PID, which is 2588, and that's the binary that corresponds to it. For more complex services, there are more binaries in the C group here key. Um, what is particularly interesting for you is, first of all, where the service file actually lives. So make sure that you shipped it to the correct path. There's also a Lintian uh, warning for that. So if you use Lintian, uh, you should catch that. Um, it should go to libsystemd system, as I mentioned. Um, it also should be enabled unless, of course, you decided to not enable it by default. Um, now, I can just show you system CTL stop. It will be dead. Just for information, the first two columns are not shown on the screen. That is a good point. Um, the first two columns are not shown, so let's make it like this. Should be much better. Great. Um, not perfect? Better? Yeah, whatever. That's good enough. So um, thinkfan.service. Um, now it's still enabled. It's still loaded, but it's inactive because I stopped it. Um, I can start it again. Wait. Uh, I can start it again. Check that it started. Um, you can also see that it used this XX start line. Um, I can also actually show you the service file. There's really no magic in here. Um, there is an XX reload um, directive here. So we can test if the reload actually works um, which I need to do as root. Um, and then in the status output, we will see that it tried to reload the service. Um, code exited status equals zero slash success, so that worked. Um, so those are a few simple things that you can check to see if your service actually works. 10 minutes, yes. Are there any questions now? Here, microphone. Uh, the example has type uh, equals forking. Yes. What are the other um, values which are valid? Um, so that was obviously um, a suggestion to open the man page and show you that it actually is documented. Um, <laughs> the man page in question here is systemd.service, as I tried to explain earlier. There's multiple types. Um, there's simple. Um, there's forking, one-shot, debus, notify, or idle. The most interesting ones are simple, forking, one-shot, and debus. Debus, I already explained. That's if you have an actual debus service. There's one-shot, which is uh, for stuff like doing one thing and then nothing. Like, it's not a permanently running service. It's just one simple command, like a shell script, and then it will stay um, active, as in started. 
um, afterwards. There is forking and there is simple. So the difference between simple and forking is that simple will, um, um, the, the, the daemon you're starting, if it's a type equal simple one, should just continue running in the foreground, whereas a forking one will fork itself into background. The preferred model is using simple, uh, because you know it's simple. Um, forking has the implicit assumption, and I think this is important to know, that um, as long as the daemon is still running in foreground, it's not ready. The unit file will be considered started um, precisely the moment where the daemon forks. That is not necessarily what your upstream software implements, but that's how it's... Um, the question was uh, when it forks or when the main process exits. Um, obviously, I think when the main process yeah. exits. Yeah. It would be really strange in the other case. Yes, but I mean, that's how it usually works, right? You, you double fork and then you exit the main process. Okay. Um, more questions? Masking processes. Masking processes, perfect. Um, let's do that. So I have, um, I have ThinkFan and I now decide that it's really a shame that my fan is not spinning up as much as I would like. So what I will just do is I will mask thinkfan.service and it will helpfully print out what it actually did, which is it just created a symlink in uh, etc, systemd, et cetera, uh, pointing to dev null. Um, so essentially it will try to load that service file but fail because it you know, can't read dev null. So if I now check uh, status on thinkfan.service, it will tell me that it's masked, but it's also still running. So if I now do systemctl stop and then status, um, it's now dead, and it will not be started um, on my next boot. So this is different you know, from uh, enable and disable because it also works for debug services and it's really like the last resort. If you really, really don't want this thing to be started, mask it. Question. But in this case, you, you cannot start it by end. You have another method uh, implemented in OS on systemd to I can't to, start to, by hand. To be able, uh, right. well, what if I want to prevent uh, a unit to start at boot? Yes, then you but disable But I want it. to be able to, to yes. run it by end. Yes, then you obviously disable it, right? Because disable just means don't start it at boot, but you can still start and stop and restart and all that stuff. Masters really don't start this at all, right? Um, so now, because I don't like loud fans, let me just unmask that. Um, all right, so now it told me that it uh, deleted that symlink and I can just start it again and it will just work. All right, more questions, please. Over there. Uh, when it's a active, it, it says active and running or it says inactive and dead. It, yes. Um, is there any particular meaning that yes. there is a part active and the part in parentheses? And yes, uh, it could be active and exited. And that would be the case for the one-shot services that just you know, uh, forked one command, that exited, but the unit is still considered active because the command succeeded. More questions over here? Is there any support for uh, what happens when a, a demon dies? Is it restarted like? Uh, yeah, I actually, I actually had this on my slides earlier. Um, Yes, more features, here we go. Um, you can specify restart sec equals one and restart on failure. There's more options in that direction to restart stuff when it dies. Okay, more questions please, here. Uh, it's about the, the packaging. Um, um, isn't it uh, possible to use uh, developer triggers? Instead, uh, we, we just put a file in deep system day and then the uh, trigger uh, happens, it means it will work uh, with other packaging system like CDBS uh, without modification. Uh, we, we actually have uh, sent a patch to CDBS and it supports the H system by now. Okay, but no why not using trigger support? Uh, not using what, sorry? Insta instead of using uh, a developer snippet, uh, inserting a developer snippet in, uh, in post-inst, yes. you could have a register a trigger uh, yeah, uh, but it's, that it's more complicated than that. Uh, that will be executed when it detects uh, a file appearing in some uh, location. Yeah, but we don't want to enable all the services by default, and then we would need to maintain a whitelist or a blacklist okay. of services and stuff. It really needs to be more flexible than that. Okay, more questions. Another one? <laughs> okay, this time it's for uh, services that uh, need uh, several instances, um, like S-Tunnel. Oh, multiple instances. Is yes, multiple instances. Yes. Uh, one with uh, usually they, they come with several configuration files. 
and we want uh, one instance per configuration file and be able to control them uh, separately. Yes, um, uh, so there are actually with, uh, there are good examples here on how that works. There's if up and there's Getty. Let me just show you Getty, which uh, has Getty at tty one dot service. And what's interesting is you can see that the service file path actually does not include that. So if we have a look at the service file, you can see that it's much more complicated than I would like it to be. But um, what's the interesting part for us is that there's a percent capital I, which will be replaced by whatever you specify after the at. Um, so you can say, um, you know, um, you can make your service file contain the at in the file name, and then use percent %i and then start a specific instance of that. Uh, and the user is expected to create uh, all the at file? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, more questions? Here. Well. How about this socket-based activation? Socket activation, that is a good question. Um, let me just have a look if I have any socket activation files lying around here. Um, I have approx.socket, which seems kind of appropriate for this conference. Um, a socket activation essentially works like this. You have socket instead of a service in your service file, um, in your socket file, sorry. Um, you um, specify a TCP port or a Unix socket or whatever it should listen on, and then there is accept equals yes, um, or the default is accept equals no. The difference is that accept equals yes mimics the uh, inet D style behavior of just you know starting one process per connection, which is kind of wasteful. And the actual real good socket activation is not having that, but um, patching the service to, um, when being started, inherit the file descriptor off the socket and then just you know uh, integrate it in its event loop and handle that. Uh, and many services are already patched for that. Um, some of them are patched but not in Debian, and some of them you would need to patch. But this is really like a thing of an hour or two. I did it for Bacula ones, for example. Okay, question over here. So the socket file just includes information about where to listen and if to accept, but uh, not what to start. Is that just in a service file then? Yes. Um, the socket file has to match by name the service file. And because I used accept equals yes, it needs to be approx at dot service, not approx dot service. And then this will in turn just say, you know, take the standard input from socket like inet does um, and start it up. Okay, one more question. So why does it mean uh, I have to add the at? Uh, because if uh, you use inetd style stuff, then for every incoming new connection, it will start a separate uh, process, right? So all these processes show up in your secret hierarchy. So that's why the instance is used here. And uh, does it also relate to exec start equals dash instead of directly the path? No. In fact, um, I already looked at this and wondered why it is there. It I think it should not be there because the minus means that ignore f uh, failures should be ignored. Um, I'm not entirely sure why it makes sense to have it here. My suspicion would be that you know if there is a connection and it goes away, then this shouldn't fail. Something like I, I would need to look that up. So sorry, no answer here. More questions. Last question. We have one minute left. Last question over there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where, where are dependencies defined in the thing? Oh yes, that's a good question. So ideally, <laughs> dependencies are not defined anywhere because they're implicit by socket activation. In case that's not the case, for example, uh, if my, I think I should probably have it here. Let me just have a look real quick. Um, I think DCS web dot service uh, is actually more. No, it doesn't have it. So there's um, in the unit section where we also specify the description, there can be a before equals and after equals. So in my case, I would start uh, code search after PostgreSQL came up, and I would just specify after equals PostgreSQL.service. Uh, you can specify multiple services there. You can specify the directive multiple times. But usually, it should not be required to specify dependencies, which is nice. OK, thank you. Okay, time is over, so I would like to say thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know and we can fix it. Thank you, Michael.